I understand when you want to get away from the preaching. It makes sense to me every time, so I'm good with it. Some guys get a little bit disturbed by that. I'm kind of happy that I uh, get the privilege to come up here and preach. It doesn't matter who hears and who doesn't. Because you know? God knows who needs to hear. That's just kind of how I leave it. So, very weird. I told you last week that I felt like God was kind of pushing me to talk about service. Service in how we serve others. And I, I thought I kind of knew where I was going. And I thought I understood what he was saying. And, you know, like I said, I, you know this, I don't really just prepare a sermon on Saturday night. I prepare a sermon usually for weeks, sometimes months ahead of time. I'm working on that and letting it kind of fall into my spirit as God opens doors and opens my eyes and helps me see. And so I hope you know that about me. Um, I struggle with people that stand in a pulpit and read somebody else's sermon. I struggle with people that come into a pulpit and are not prepared. And so I don't ever plan to do that to you. And so with that said, I thought this week I knew right where I was going. So last Sunday, we left here, and I don't know, somewhere around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I got this really bad headache, and I fell asleep on the couch. And then I woke up in time to come over for our mission time. If you aren't coming to that, you're really missing some big things. Robin Hunter has been leading, and it has been incredible. So you don't want to miss that. You want to be here, trust me. Um, so, anyway, that was just a side note, a little commercial. <laughs> I wasn't planning to give. Anyway, um, but I came over for that, and, and just from that time on, my head started pounding. I said I got sick. I don't know if I really got sick. It's not like I was doing all the things that you do when you're sick. We'll leave out the detail. But I had a major headache, and I couldn't get off the couch for two days. And so... By Wednesday, when I said, okay, God, you know, I know I have the beginning of this sermon, but we really need to put it together, and you haven't really given me enough here, and my head's still not quite right, so what are we doing? And God said, well, open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I said, what? Um, God? Did you forget what you told me before? I mean, obviously you're confused, right? God gets confused. And obviously you're confused. This is not where I've been studying. This is not what you've been telling me. This is not at all where we've been going. If I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I have to scrap what I've already got written down, where I've already started, where I thought you were showing me. And he said... How about going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? <laughs> okay, God. So I opened my Bible and I read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then I got out my iPad and went to a different version and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And went to another version and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm like, okay, God, wait. I get what this is saying, but this is not what you've been showing me. I was trying hard to understand what God was saying so that I knew if this was for me or if it was for us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How about an amen? Amen. amen? Perfect. Okay, so he said, I want you to understand where I'm taking you in this sermon or this series about service. Because honestly, I don't know at this point if it's a series or if it's a sermon. I thought I knew until Tuesday afternoon when I was reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12 over and over and over. So I'm going to do this sermon just a little bit backwards. I'm going to tell you the main point right up front, which I usually do, but I don't usually go into major detail about it. I want you to know what I'm talking about under this heading of service. 
This is what God said to me when I finally shut up and quit saying, God, this isn't what you're taking. This isn't what you're... When I finally stopped and said, okay, show me what you want. He said this, word for word. Will you, you, we will never be able to serve our community or those around us until we learn to serve each other. Amen. Hmm. We talk a lot about serving our community, don't we? We talk a lot about how we need to do things for other people. We talk a lot about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right? We do. But God said, we will never be able to serve our community or those around us until we learn to serve each other. Ouch. I've just finished reading through the passage again. And I stopped and asked God what he was trying to show me. And that's what he said. That's what he said. And it was plain as day. There was no doubt what he was saying to me. So this week, I'm going to be reading to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Surprised? <laughs> And I'm going to read a little bit more than just chapter 12. I'm going to read all of chapter 12, by the way. I don't know about you, but I, I start reading Scripture and I'm like, this just doesn't stop. This isn't something I can just read a verse of or two verses of. It's just something that it gets in my soul. I have to admit, I'm in love with, with the Word of God. I just really enjoy what it says to me. And so as I'm reading and I'm looking for the break, uh, I didn't find it until I got to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. So, with that said, if you would, would you stand with me in honor and reverence to the Word of God? And I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 3 of chapter 13. It says this. <clears throat> What I want to talk to you about now, I'm sorry, let me tell you that I'm talking to you today from the message. I really like the message sometimes. Sometimes it clears things up for me. And it did the more I read. And like I just told you, I probably read this in at least eight different versions this past week. What I want to talk to you about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it? It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus be damned. Nor would anyone be inclined to say, Jesus is master, without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various <laughs> gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they, are, they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in, every, are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and all kinds of, to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out by one, I'm sorry, handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, 
you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek or slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. Listen to this, please. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a piece of, I don't deserve a piece on the head, a place on the head, would you want to remove it from your body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it, as it is, we see that, that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. No matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. Keep that in mind in your ministry, will you? What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic, and therefore necessary, you can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparison. If anything you have more, cons if anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion over a full-bodied hair? The way God designed our bodies is a model for our understanding, for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part, the parts we mention and the parts we don't, the parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body, of that body, does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in his church, which is his body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. But it's obvious by now, isn't it? That Christ's church is a complete body that is not a gigantic, un unidimensional part. It, it's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle work worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But now, I want to lay out a far better way for you. If I speak with human elegance and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a cranking, but a creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, 
And if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the state to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Let me pray for us. God, this passage has been speaking to me now for six days. It's been reverberating in my mind and in my soul. God, you seem to be adamant that you're bringing a word to us. So help us, Lord, to hear. Help us to receive. Help us to not get an attitude or have any kind of reluctance to listen. But Lord, make us into your body. One unified body working together to serve each other and to serve this community. Show us, God, what you want from us. And help us to follow you. And we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. I know that was a long time for you to stand while I read that, but in case you haven't figured this out, I get to stand through the whole service. So I don't have a lot of sympathy when you have to stand for a couple minutes. I'm sorry. But there's a couple things here that I really feel are important. There's a couple things here that I think are something more than just, just hearing the word. You know that I could take this whole this whole passage and I could break it down and I could preach to you from it. I know that you know that because I've done that. But if I do that, we're going to miss the dinner on the grounds. We're going to miss most of the afternoon and we're going to just stay for deeper in the work. Because it's going to be a long time trying to get through all of that, right? So I'm going to pick through the passage and make the points that I feel God was pointing out to me. I want to share all of this passage. I wanted you to hear all of this passage so that you would get the all over or the overall type idea of what we're talking about, even if you don't personally take the time to read your Bible. And I know that some of you read your Bible every day, but I also know that some of you don't. And I wanted you to hear this whole scripture, because I want you to understand how it all works together. Those of you that do read your Bible and you study your scriptures, I wanted to give you something to chew on this next week. And I think you're going to find something in here to chew on over this next week. So right from the beginning, this passage started speaking to me. Most of you know me well enough to know that I like to figure things out for myself. I'm just not very good at taking somebody else's word for it. The Apostle Paul says at the very beginning of this thought that he wants to help us find the truth. That's what he's saying. The whole point of this passage is that he wants us to find the truth. He says, what I want to talk to you about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is a complex and most and often misunderstood way, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God? Do you remember how you were when you didn't know God? You're led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. Meaning, the Christian life. The people that follow God. It's different for us. First check. Is it different? Is it different for you? Or can anybody even tell the difference between you and those who don't know God? It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as well as we can. For in instance, 
By using your head, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say Jesus began. That's pretty obvious, right? You can use your brain and figure that out. If you're a true follower of God, you're not going to go around cursing people in the name of Jesus, and you're not going to go around cursing God. That's what that's saying. But the other thing is, Nobody would be inclined to say Jesus is master without the insight of the Holy Spirit. How do you feel about that? Do you walk around realizing that Jesus is Lord? Lord, with a capital L, means that He's in charge of your life. You've given Him the keys. You've given Him the steering wheel. He's in the driver's seat, not you. When you realize that, it changes some things. So, we can all see that Paul's saying that this, this Christian thing, this following Jesus thing, it's meant to be figured out. Uh-oh. What about all those years that I've heard that it's a spiritual thing and I'm not supposed to do anything but just sit back and let God do it? Well, that's true. God does it. You have to let him do it, which means you have to figure out how to get out of the way. Right? It's meant to be a mental attachment that makes a difference in our lives. We're supposed to think things through. I've heard, and probably some of you have said this, I've heard many times over the years because I've used it, that I don't always understand what God's saying. Remember how I started this sermon? Wait a minute, God. Whoa, whoa, that's not where you were taking me. I haven't even been in 1 Corinthians in all this reading. I've been reading a lot about service. I'm hearing what you're saying. I know where you're showing me to go. Why are you telling me to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12? It's a mental attachment that makes a difference in our lives. It makes a difference in the way we live. In what we say, in where we go, and who we hang out with, it makes a difference. We shouldn't take this or anything else as it's stated, but we should be willing to think through it and consider what's being taught. Think it through. Sometimes there can be a trip. It won't be coming from God, but sometimes. There can be something there, a little snag wire to catch your toe on. And it won't be from God, but it'll be enough to mess up where you think you're supposed to be and where God's trying to take you. He then goes into the gifts of the Spirit. And these are important. <clears throat> I really believe that the gifts of the, of the Spirit are something very important that we should take some time to look at and see what they mean for each one of us. But... That's for another day. Because if we start getting into the gifts of the Spirit, it's going to take a long time to get through all that. And I know some of you are going to get hungry. What I want you to see here is that all the gifts come from the same source. They all come from the Holy Spirit. I've had a lot of conversations about these gifts over the years. And I stand here as a Church of the Nazarene pastor because God has gifted me with a call to preach. Amen. I'm here because I believe we have use of the gifts as they're needed. But I don't believe that all gifts need to be manifested in our services all the time. There's times and there's places for every one of these gifts. That's why they're there. But every one of these gifts don't have to come forth every week, every Sunday when we're together. I'm sorry. They just don't. The Holy Spirit gives us the gifts that we need as we need them. And I believe you should live in the gifts He gives you. When God gives you a gift, use it. Share it. Do not, by any means, hold back. Do not, I believe it says something like, do not quench the Spirit of God. Amen. The Spirit of God is giving you gifts Use them. Let Him manifest in you and through you. And He will make a difference. Not just in you, but
but in everybody that comes around you. If you've received one or more of these gifts, God has given it to you for a reason. As he reveals those reasons to you, follow him. That seems pretty simple. You don't need a preacher up here to tell you that. If you have a gift, which you do if you're a follower of Christ, it comes with it. If you are following Christ, you get a gift from the Spirit. Period. It's true. Use it. The main point that I see Paul making with all of this is that there is one Spirit. And He alone blesses us. We are His followers. And He blesses us with what we need to live for Him. That's it. He gives us what we need. And He'll continue to give us what we need. And if we will step into what He gives us, we'll grow. And He'll give us something else. But if we say, oh God, isn't that nice? I'd love to be over there, but it would require me moving my right foot towards you. I'm not really ready to do that yet, God. Stop the blessings. I'm not moving toward God. He's not giving me more. He's waiting for me to step into what He has for me. As I step into it, He'll open more doors. That's where we all need to be. This is where we usually split the passage. Right there, that passage always stops. And this is why I read it all to you today. See, the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the body at this point. And he seems to leave the gifts and the intellect behind for the time being. I don't think that's correct. That's why I read it to you like I did. I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't believe for a second that's what he's doing. I believe he's asking all of, he's taking all of this info into account as he presents who the body of Christ is and how they should live. This is why I felt God was pointing me to this passage. I believe this is what God was saying to me and this is what I believe he wanted me to say to you. We are all part of Christ's body if we've chosen to follow him. We are all part of God, Christ's body if we've chosen to follow him. We are all part of Christ's body until if we've chosen to follow him. Thank you. Because I can say it again if more people need to say amen. We are all part of Christ's body if we've chosen to follow him. Amen. Thank you. There is no one here who can claim to be better or more important than anyone else. Amen. Sorry. Sorry. None of you are better than the guy or girl next to you. We're all part of Christ's body if we've chosen to follow Him. Amen. Thank you. Each one of us has something we're supposed to be doing. Each one of us have a call on our lives. Each one of us has a burden we carry. Amen. Tell me, just raise your hand if you have nobody in your life that you know needs Jesus. Go ahead. Just You don't know anybody, anybody in your life that everybody you know knows Jesus and is walking close to Him and is really close to Him. It's not very many of us that do that because we all have somebody in our life that needs Jesus. So each of us carry a burden. Each of us has a function that wouldn't happen quite the same if we were not doing it. It's true. That's why it hurts so much when one or more of us misses a service. just want you to know. When one person is missing, there's a hole left in the place. And I'm not talking about the chair that they sit in. But maybe. You may not think you have any bearing on our service. You may not think you have anything to do with the way the service flows. But when you're not there, next to the person that you usually sit by, they feel your absence. 
They know you're missing. And something is just When you're not here to smile at one of the children, they notice and they miss you. If you don't believe that, try, if you're somebody that brings some change every week and you drop it in their, in their cup every week, try one week not bringing any change. <laughs> Go ahead, try it. You'll know they miss it when you're not here. They, and they miss it when you're not here just as much as when you don't have any change. Hmm. When you're not here to share how your week went with the guys out by the breakfast table or with the Sunday school class or with the prayer group that meets at 8.30, they feel your absence. And it throws everything off just a little. I heard a story once about a guy who got up one Sunday, morning, one Sunday morning and he was complaining about how much he didn't want to go to church. He was telling his wife all the things that were going wrong. He told, him about, he told her about the coffee table and how the coffee table just bothered him. They never had good coffee. They quit serving Starbucks coffee. I don't know. The pastor quit working at Starbucks and now they don't sell it or serve it. They always have stuff on there, but it's never the stuff he wants. He's complaining about how the music people never sing his favorite hymn. They don't know I wonder as I wander. <laughs> and it bothers them to death. <laughs> and the more he thought about it, he told his wife, he didn't even think the people liked him at church. He didn't think the people even cared whether he was there. They figured that he figured that they probably wouldn't even notice if he didn't show up. But at that point, his wife had had enough, and she said, well, dear, you're the pastor. They'll probably notice. You see, sometimes we make excuses so we don't have to go to church. Sometimes we have legitimate reasons to miss. But every time we miss, it leaves a hole where we normally would be. And it throws everything off just a little. So imagine what half of you miss, how off it feels. I really like the way the message put verse 15 through 18. It reads this way. If foot said, I'm not eligible or I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. This has a direct translation. It's a direct <coughs> translation. Anyone, everyone of you, any one among us, every one of you, has a place, and every one of you has something to do. Amen. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. Amen. You know what my favorite part of Wednesday night is? I love teaching. I love hanging out with the young adults. I love hanging out with the adults. You want to know what my favorite part of Wednesday night was? If you don't know already, it's those three or four little boys that come running in saying, Hi, Pastor! And wrapping her in their arms around my leg. Oh, he took no guy. guy. I mean, the first time they did that, I was caught off guard. The last time they did that, or didn't do that, I was like, where's the boys? I need the boys. Right? <clears throat> None of you needs to be explained what this means. None of you are replaceable. We always talk about how everybody is replaceable. None of you are replaceable. Amen. You all have a part of this body. You all <coughs> contribute to this body. Amen. And when you are missing, it hurts. None of you are less important. 
all of you are necessary for this gathering to thrive. Amen. All of you are necessary for this gathering to grow. Amen. Amen. All of you are necessary for this gathering to be what God meant it to be. Amen. So please, don't let anything come between you and your church body. It's a part of you and you're a part of it because that's the way Christ Jesus intended it to be when he gave it to his disciples. It's just the way it is. He said, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he gave it to the disciples. He told them to told them to gather in the upper room and wait until he sent them the Comforter. The Comforter today is known as the Holy Spirit. And he draws us together. And he molds us into one unified body working for him. That becomes the image of Christ. So if all of this is true, how can we not understand that we are here to serve each other? Remember, that's what I heard that I was supposed to tell you today. We will never be able to serve our community or those around us until we learn to serve each other. Verse 25 through 27 says, The way God designed our body is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. That's pretty strong and pretty straightforward. Only when you are willing to accept the part of the body that you are does it begin to mean anything. This is kind of hard to hear, so please listen close. I know that you're private people. Most of you try to keep your personal lives separate from your church life. I understand that. So do I. I know that you don't want to call attention to yourself. We don't like to be in the spotlight. Even as the pastor, I don't like to be in the spotlight. I know that you don't want to share your talent. Because I know many of you can sing. I walk around this place when we're singing. I know probably a lot of you have some kind of instrumental talent. I know that a lot of you have organizational talent. I know that a lot of you have talent. And you don't really want to share it. I know that you feel strange about standing up in front of people. If you think that you're very comfortable with that, just let me know and I'll have you come up here and share a word at some time. It's not as comfortable as you think. I know you struggle to teach. I know you don't think you can sing. I know your finances are tight. I know, I know, I know. But I also know that when you're hurting, we all hurt. When you are struggling through something in your life, we all struggle with you. When you are experiencing some great revelation, we rejoice with you. And when you receive good news, we're all happy with you. That's how the body works. If you smash your finger, I know you've all smashed your finger. If you haven't, I have a hammer. I'll, I'll let you share it. When you smash your finger, there's something in your stomach that hurts. Right? I mean, when you smash your finger good, Something like right here that just goes, oh, talk about smashing fingers. Right? 
I didn't hit myself in the gut, but my gut hurts because I smashed my finger. Please let yourself be a part of the body that is already taking you into itself. You're already a part of us. We're not letting go. Because I don't know if you've ever tried it, but if you cut off your finger, that's a lot worse than smashing. Ah. Right? If you're not sure, talk to John later on. <laughs> right? That's why he laughed. Because he knows that firsthand. We're not letting go. You're already a part of us. Please, become a part of us. So, try to open up to the people who honestly care about you and your families. And let them know how to pray for you. It's only been four weeks since we talked about prayer. And we're all challenged to pray. But we don't always know what to pray for. Share with us. Let us share your burden. We all have people in our lives who we know need to find Jesus. Maybe some of them aren't even actively looking for Him. But we know they need Him in their lives, right? Why can't we share? Why can't we have a prayer feast at somebody's house or even here sometime just to come forward and pray for each other's needs? Pray for those who were burdened that they would find Jesus. See, you all carry burdens. And a burden hurts. But when you hurt, we hurt. Remember? And when something great happens in your life, we all rejoice. I'm going to end with one last thought from the Apostle Paul. Let me say that I think this is one of the worst chapter breaks in Scripture. I know that it would be really long, a really long chapter, probably the longest chapter in the Bible, honestly, if this thought went from beginning to end. But this thought starts in Romans, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1, verse 1. It doesn't end until the end of chapter 14. They all run together. And if you want a true sense of what Paul was saying, you really need to read all of it together. So, Paul says, starting in verse 31 and following, says, and yet, some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But now, I want to lay out a far better way for you. If I speak with human elegance and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love. I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt, but I love. Rachel's doing exactly what I keep thinking every time I read this. If you listen to For Kenyan Country at all, <laughs> I really wanted to I really wanted to use my English accent, my British accent, to try to talk about this because, because they quote this scripture word for word in their song from the message. And here's the point. We are one body. We are meant to live together. We're meant to care for each other. We're meant to make a difference together. And we can only do these things if we first learn to love.
God said, we will never be able to serve our community or those around us until we learn to serve each other. Will you allow us to serve you? That's another part of it. Will you allow us to serve you? Will you begin to serve your neighbor? We are the body of Christ on this hill. We are sent to be a beacon of light to this community. But we will never be able to do what we need to do until we begin to serve each other with love and humanity. Humble yourself. Love each other. Serve each other. And God will send you. Please stand with me. Lord God, I know.